this did get shared. We'll see if any folks from other communities end up joining, but some other communities that were actively thinking about peer review were also invited today, though a little last minute. So we'll see what comes up there. Awesome. But yeah, welcome, welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, March 24th, uh, and uh, this is our second community call of the week. And this is our first actual official, I guess, community call swap that we did this week, uh, where uh, Nick, Umar, and myself hopped into the Research Hub community call earlier this week. Uh, and today we have uh, Patrick Joyce and Satvik Sony from Research Hub who just hopped into our community call. And Patrick is going to present a little bit about Research Hub and about what they're thinking about peer review. And then we'll just have a general discussion on open peer review and go from there. So yeah, with that, Patrick, please uh, feel free to hop in and introduce yourself and Research Hub. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as Eugene said, my name is Patrick, and I'm working on a project called Research Hub, where the mission is to accelerate the pace of scientific research. Uh, just like a little bit of background on myself, and thanks, Eugene, for having us. I think it was a blast to have you at our community call on Monday, so we should totally do more stuff like this in the future. Um, yeah, so just a little sure. bit about me. Uh, I'm a former um, PhD student in molecular biology who dropped out with master's started medical school, was frustrated with kind of the infrastructure for funding and publishing scientific research. So I took a year off school, uh, huge Reddit nerd. Um, one of my favorite implementations of blockchain was Steemit, which was basically a like token powered Reddit forum where you could set incentives for like user behavior. And uh, I was like, wow, this is powerful. Like this could be applied to scientific research, like trying to set like financial incentives for specific behaviors that are healthy for the research community as a whole. So I started a project where I was kind of trying to work on that idea, um, have been doing it since like, I think like late 2016. So it's been a while now and uh, made a little bit of progress, um, found a great partner and have started to build a research hub. So um, yeah, our goal right now, we kind of have like a V1 Reddit style forum uh, where people can like post papers and comment on them, earning tokens for like interacting with the scientific community. But our end goal is to create a preprint server where there can be open uh, incentivized peer review on top of it, and then also a funding mechanism. So in theory, we can try and help like uh, put, um, you know, marketplace pressure on some of the established uh, figures in scientific publishing to do a couple things. One is open access. So finding new business models that don't have anything to do with paywalls, which is just important for the world progressing faster. And then two, actually like starting to pay scientists for the content they create. You guys, I'm sure are all familiar with how crazy journal business models are. So yeah, that's kind of where we're coming from with Research Hub. And I'm um, really glad uh, Eugene and I got in touch at uh, ETH Denver a few months ago because we're starting to work on some features around peer review. And it seems like a lot of people in the DSI community are kind of thinking about this. So I'm excited to like see the different approaches and I'm sure one of them is going to take off. So like the more that we can like interact and help to share notes and like learnings, I think the better off uh, the community will be as a whole. So with that being said, I have some designs on peer review, but at any point, like if you guys have any questions, like feel free to just hop in and ask me. Um, these are very early. So it's kind of like a design iteration. We'll like do designs and then like talk about it, get feedback and iterate a few times before we actually start to try and implement anything from an engineering perspective. So I guess like with that being said, to set the scene for how we're thinking about peer review, um, what we would like to have is essentially like a, a universal um, peer review form that can be applied to any type of scientific research, where in theory, there's kind of two type of reviewers that we're thinking of. One is like a, a professional reviewer, kind of in the traditional like academic sense, where there's an expert in a field who's recruited in order to share their opinion about a paper. And then there's also like a second category, which is like crowdsourced review where anyone in the world can in theory like share their opinions of a scientific paper. Uh, the analogy that we kind of think about is uh, Rotten Tomatoes, where like when you're looking at a movie, there's like a score for that movie. One is like the, um, you know, critics score and one is the audience score. And there's a lot of signal if it's like a high audience score, but low critic score or high critic score, low audience score, you know, there's, there's insight that you can glean there. So yeah, the idea here, and I'll uh, start to show our designs. And again, this is very early stage. Like we're going to probably change a lot here. Um, but yeah, so there's two separate ways to do this. 
The first is like actually recruiting peer reviewers kind of in the traditional sense. And the second is having people come to you. So this is the crowdsourced version where in theory we have an article where if you stumble across it or you Google search it, you come to Research Hub, you yourself can leave a review. There'd be a little button on the right side where when you press that, you get some kind of standardized form that pops up where you can leave a qualitative review, just saying like, you know, in words, like what you think about the paper prompted by uh, like specific prompts. We're thinking there's a, like a, the Cochrane uh, Systematic Reviews. Have you all ever heard of that? They have a uh, basically like a checklist for, I, I forget the exact term, but it's like quality review of papers or something like that. I'll, I'll follow up afterwards with Eugene with a link, but uh, it's kind of like, is the methodology sound, you know, or the statistics like done in an ethical way? I'm making things up, but it's like a, a like uniform way to compare all kinds of scientific papers. And so we'll, we'll have like a, um, a thing you can write out and then also uh, like numerical scores. So in theory, what we'd like to have eventually is if you're on Research Hub's homepage or when you click into a paper page itself, um, here's like an example of Research Hub's homepage, uh, you would be able to see like a quality score next to a paper. So when you click into a paper, you can automatically glean some context and like, hey, do experts think that this is like methodologically sound? Like, do they think it's able to replicate? And then do crowdsourced like peer reviewers also feel the same way that experts do? Or is there some kind of disconnect for some reason? Um, so yeah, let me get back here. Um, so in theory, people would fill out their peer review, um, add like some kind of numerical score And then it would eventually be published as a comment within uh, the comment section of Research Hub. We'd have like a different tab for peer reviews. The author would get notified and be able to essentially like respond to any peer reviews that happen. And then um, this isn't here yet, but we'd eventually uh, have some kind of like tag on a paper where if we did a traditional version where an editor recruited like two or three professional peer reviewers, once those professional peer reviewers felt like the research manuscript was a significant contribution to the field, they could add like a peer reviewed tag. And then in theory, you know, it's a preprint that has gone through like peer review. So that's the first like crowdsourced version. Um, the second version, here we go. Sorry, normally our lead engineer does these presentations. So I'm not like the smoothest at Figma. I guess uh, I saw someone had pressed a comment here. Is there, oh, okay, you left the link. Nice, thank yeah, you. Yeah, Nick dropped the link to the chat. Yeah, thanks, mentioned. Appreciate it, man. I'll read out any questions if they come up. And yeah, just for that, for anyone who does have questions, please feel free to either uh, raise your hand and I can flag that for Patrick, uh, or if anyone wants to drop any questions in the chat, I'm happy to read those out while he's presenting. Yeah, I guess while we're paused, I do have one question. Um, you mentioned finding the expert peer reviewers. Um, how would you go about like identifying those peer reviewers and getting them on board? Yeah, so the way this normally works is like, uh, for instance, I'm familiar with molecular biology, right? And so um, if I were applying to publish a paper in a synthetic biology journal, the journal itself would have like, you know, a editorial board of synthetic biologists who know their field well and would be able to essentially tap people in the field who have expertise about my paper and would be able to share like a, a meaningful review. And so essentially to accomplish this, you need a human who is within kind of the larger field of synthetic biology, who at least knows enough to be able to find like an individual researcher who's working on similar things to what the submitted manuscript is working on. At Research Hub, we have this concept of an editor program where we have like a group of like uh, late stage PhD students, postdocs, early career researchers who uh, earn monthly salaries in research coin in order to uh, like basically maintain hubs. So act as like the editor of our concept of an individual journal, which is a hub. And so these editors uh, essentially have expertise where they'd be able to recognize like what a submitted uh, preprint, like the, the specific subfield that it's in and then they'd be able to recruit peer reviewers. 
so cold emails you know for for like a, like a lack of a better term but that's the same way that it works within academia currently so um in theory we'd be able to send these cold emails where um hopefully it would be attractive enough to researchers to share peer review because it can be public um they can actually like add it to their resume like there'll be like a like a eternal link that they'd be able to share like their peer review history and then also um they can earn some tokens so maybe like their time is appropriately compensated for like the expertise that they have and the effort that they're willing to put into a review so yeah w with the like traditional peer review perspective not crowdsourced um it would be very similar to like a traditional journal where there's an editor of sorts who's reaching out to experts to like basically ask if they would be willing to provide a peer review okay nice thanks for the details yeah definitely and so kind of talking about recruiting uh peer reviewers from the crowdsourced method a couple of things that we've been thinking about are like um so a little bit of context in research hub papers earn a uh, research coin based on how many upvotes they receive. So if a paper's earned 100 upvotes, um, there's a certain amount of research coin that goes with that. So we're thinking about saying that like a certain portion of the upvotes would be dedicated to a peer review bounty. So maybe if a paper's earned 100 upvotes and there's 100 research coin available to it, 5% uh, automatically kind of stack up within this like growing bounty for peer reviewers as more people find this paper important. And so the idea here is that you can try and help to use financial incentives to direct people's critical attention towards the papers that are receiving like kind of the most love in any given moment. So that's one way we could do it. Another way we could do it is having like a, a set bounty mechanism. For instance, um, like I mentioned, I'm interested in like molecular biology. Like if there's a really cool paper that I see where I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Like I would love to know like somebody who's actually in the field every day. Like, is this legit? Like, will this be able to be replicated? Like, am I just excited about this? And it's kind of overstating its findings. I could say, hey, like it's worth 25 bucks to me to be able to have an expert to come in and review this. And so I could put, uh, you know, $25 worth of research coin onto the paper as a bounty for a reviewer to come in essentially like increasing the financial incentive for people to critically evaluate a paper. And in theory, like uh, I always think about the, um, you know, cliche, obviously everybody's tired of it, but like uh, when COVID first started, how there were so many papers coming out all the time. And like, there was almost like, like, you know, like political leanings to how people interpreted the science. So in theory, like if you see a paper where like there's a lot of buzz about it online and you'd like to see experts like critically evaluate it to know whether the findings are viable or not, um, you'd be able to say, hey, like this is worth it to me to have like, you know, put 50 bucks on this paper to know do masks actually stop like transmission of COVID within closed like restaurants or something like that. And you can have like experts come in and actually like provide their opinion of the methodology in the paper, the statistics, the conclusions, like whether they think it would replicate and provide, I think, like very important context to some of the information that's coming out in real time on preprint servers. So that's kind of like the overall way we're thinking of it right now. Um, another kind of twist that we've considered is breaking a review down into like different portions based on expertise. So if it's a molecular biology paper, you could have a molecular biologist review like the methods section and the interpretation of the results. But maybe it'd be better to have like a statistician review like the statistical portions of the paper. And so uh, one thing we're working on in Research Hub uh, with the help of actually some people we met at ETH Denver doing decentralized uh, identifications is to tie like a uh, individual users actual real life scientific expertise to their research hub user profile so we'd be able to essentially like sort by molecular biologists and statisticians and uh, send review requests to people based on their expertise in order to have like experts review the portions of the paper that are most relevant to their own experience so yeah just the there's lots of different directions that this could go and realistically, it'll probably be two or three months before we have like a viable V1 out there. Um, but this is kind of how we're thinking about it initially. So we'd love to hear what everybody thinks and especially like critical comments. Like how, how could this go wrong? I think it's like the most uh, useful thing for us in order to like try and improve our concepts. So yeah, th thanks for having us. And um, very curious to hear what you all think.
Yeah, of course. Thank you for presenting that. And yeah, again, for anyone who either wants to drop questions in chat or uh, raise your hand so we can build up a queue of anyone who wants to, to ask any direct questions, I do want to start off with one. In terms of the, the way you're thinking about the bounty for peer review, would the only person who is able to put up that bounty, so if I'm an author on a paper, is it only up to me to put up that bounty? Or can an external party come in and say, well, no, actually, the, you know, like your example of COVID, where a health organization can actually come in and say, no, 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 like we will sponsor these bounties because we want to just see more rigorous review of this topic. Yeah, absolutely. We're thinking anybody could add a bounty basically to help to attract experts to come in to review a paper. Um, so, so that's how we're thinking with the peer review now. One, one opportunity that we see, and this is like looking from a revenue model type of perspective, is like uh, article processing charges. These are not great. Like, I know you guys have seen the memed, like, nature neuroscience thing where it was like, hey, like, if you want to publish open access, it's going to cost you 10K. And so, like, where's that 10K going? <laughs> you know, like, how does that work? And so, like, even, like, like um, affordable open access journals, like, they range between 500 to 1500 for article processing charges. And a lot of that goes to like maintaining the operations of a journal that's like maybe not the most efficient. Um, so one thing that we could do is uh, basically create APCs where an author can like uh, add a variable APC to their uh, preprint uh, submission. And um, like the research hub community could take like a two or three percent revenue on it, and then the rest of it could be distributed directly to peer reviewers. So if you're an author and you're like, hey, like I really want like awesome peer review on this, I could say I'll put fifteen hundred dollars worth of research coin as like a bounty for others to come in and review my paper. And so this is this is also kind of cool because um, like what researchers really want right now is not crypto. They want citations like crypto is like a nice benefit but most people want to like be successful in the current academia uh like academic structure and so ha having like uh, financial bounties on peer review can almost be a good way to get experts in your field to look at your stuff and like read your stuff and have a good reason to pay attention to what you're doing and then maybe cite you in the future so um yeah, we, we haven't finished thinking about APCs, but I do think there's a cool opportunity to essentially do what open access journals are doing now, but cheaper and make sure most of that money, like the grand, grand majority of it goes to the people doing the work, which is peer reviewers who are now doing it for free, essentially like um, career prestige or like a responsibility to the field. And a quick clarifying question, you said APCs? Our political processing charge is like the business model for a lot of open access journals where like if I wanted to publish, uh, I would pay the journal 500 to 1500 to 10,000 if you're nature um, in order to like have them do peer review and like basically like typesetting more or less. But Great. And I see Faith asked the question that Sattvik already started answering in chat, but just in case you have anything else to add, is the scope just blockchain and crypto or is it much more general? And it sounds heavily scientific and technical. Are there any other disciplines like econ or law? Yeah, so we have like a wide range of different hubs right now. Um, so we eventually want to have, there's like official taxonomies for like academic subfields basically. And eventually like we'd like to have editors, you know, for all kinds of different fields. Sort of initially we're starting off with the harder sciences just to like, uh, we've read a lot about like technical forums and you kind of set the culture of the forum within the first like 500 to a thousand users. And so we'd like to keep things like extremely rigorous and professional and like, you know, a, a, a beat having fun, but also like, I think it's easier to start technical and then become less technical over time than it is to go in the other direction. So yeah, I, I, and I'm also biased. Like I'm a molecular biologist, psychiatrist, you know, is what I was studying. So that's kind of like what I'm most familiar with personally. Um, yeah, we do have a, a law hub though that has a couple editors. We have like a business hub that has a couple editors and an econ hub. So yeah, it's kind of all over the place right now. Great, thank you for that. And I know Lewis and then Paul, it'll be you're up next. But Lewis asked the question in chat. Uh, Thanks for that. I think financially incentivizing reviews is a great idea, but it will be very important to ensure that the reviews themselves are vetted for quality. 
perhaps the payment can be conditional on passing some quality control. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is kind of like our ethos in general at Research Hub is what's the simplest V1, get it out there, see how people use it, collect feedback, talk to customers, see like what's working, what's not working and iterate. And so improve things kind of over time once you actually have people using the product and like you can see how they're using it. Um, so one thing that we find like to be like pretty challenging is like, like uh, a priori tokenomics. So trying to figure out like, how do you financially incentivize pure viewers like in the best way, just purely from a theoretical perspective without like conducting an experiment kind of like game theory style. And so, um, like, we've thought a lot about this, where, like, if you're financially incentivizing reviewers, like, will they, in theory, just do, like, Eugene, you mentioned in our community call, the absolute minimum amount of work in order to, like, justify collecting the bounty? And, like, we've actually had experience working with, like, uh, scientists on Collab Tree, where we did, like, a mini experiment of, like, paying people $200 to review a paper. And it, it was literally the minimum possible effort for those $200. And yeah, I think it's, it's going to be like a lot of iteration to figure out like how you tie the financial incentives to people's like, you know, real life reputation where, where I think in theory um, with research hub in general, we, we want to have the token be an additional piece of the product, not like the, the utility of the product should be sans token. So the website by itself should be functional enough where like people want to come in and peer review just because in theory, like it can help their own careers. Um, and then the token is just an additional benefit on top of that. So yeah, I think there's a couple ways we could do this. One, we could do reviews of reviews. So like if I publish a paper and Eugene wants to review it and then Satvik can come in and say, hey, yeah, this is a good faith review by Eugene. I think it was like, you know, critical, but fair and productive. And like, this was a good review. Um, so that's the way we could do it. Like have upvotes, downvotes on the reviews itself. Or like uh, I was mentioned or saying earlier, there's like a, another DSI project working on uh, DIDs, like uh, tying like people's like real life academic expertise to like a identifier on a blockchain. And so in theory, we could try and filter things by people's real life expertise. And I think that would help to limit some of the like potential uh, failure cases when it comes to peer review. If you've already like established that, hey, yeah, Eugene's an expert, you know, he's a PhD in psychology. He's got a hundred papers that he's published already. Um, like in theory, you can trust that person. A and even more so if that person is like sharing low quality reviews online for free, like it's almost detrimental to their own career because like we have decent SEO, you know, people will be able to find it. And so, yeah, I think kind of it's not a little bit of a rant there, but I think over time we'll, we'll figure out the balance of like the financial and professional incentives where like it will work over time. But with that being said, the first iteration is, definitely not gonna work. And there will be like, you know, probably bad incentives that come out of it. And over time, we'll figure it out and iterate in order to get it right. That's great. And just quick clarifier before I hand it off to Paul, for the DID project, is that Opsion crew? Yeah, yeah. Cool, I'll share a link of theirs as well in the chat so folks can learn. Paul, please, you're up, uh, you're up now. And a quick follow up on that question. Um, you mentioned having the review of reviews and that being like someone else in the community. Do you think that could also be the person who's being reviewed to measure the quality of the review? Or is there like a conflict of interest there? It's a great question. Like it's definitely possible. I know I've seen um, like F1000. Have you guys ever seen that journal? It's like a preprint server. They have uh, open peer review. And so you can actually see like a dialogue between the reviewer and the author, which is I always think is like kind of insightful and cool to see that interaction. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that could be cool. Um, I, I like having a degree of separation, just like my gut feeling. Uh, cause a lot of times, like, um, like when I was in grad school, it's like five years of your life and like, you know, the job market's so competitive and your like whole future is kind of on the line. And if somebody gives you a bad review, like emotions, you know, totally reasonably like can get involved. So I think it's always better to have like somebody with a degree of separation, um, to say like hey yeah this review is you know in good faith like they're trying to improve the paper it's not like unnecessary criticisms or it's not like way too like easy on the author or anything like that 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, Paul, please jump in and then I'll get Chris's question and then Umar. Yeah, I was also just kind of generally interested in this kind of the meta moderation or sorry, the meta review kind of mechanism that you're doing. I think that's going to be incredibly important and that that should kind of be happening in the open. So I really appreciate your kind of discussion of that. Um, along those lines, when it comes to, you know, here are the good things that you're trying to build, which I think there's a lot. There's still like some benefits from kind of that blind peer review that has been created over time. So kind of wondering like what types of benefits you see from blind peer review and how we might be able to capture those benefits. So that's kind of part one of my question. And I, I'm going to be an academic, so I'm going to give you a part two as well. Uh, okay. So the second part is in kind of in your discussion a little bit, like there's an opportunity to respond to a review, which I think is awesome, right? Because that happens in kind of traditional journal publications as well, but it's like very internal. Um, I do kind of wonder if there's maybe a way or if, you, if your team has kind of considered a buffer so that let's say a person who has a like an expert in a the field, they publish a paper and people who are non-experts then keep requesting a response because we've kind of seen that in Twitter spaces where, ah, so this person must be wrong because they won't take me up on my idea that I had while I was taking a walk this morning. Uh, to put that dynamic very politely. So I'm kind of wondering how we do those buffers and then how do we kind of take advantage of the things that are blind peer review? So so for blind peer review, are you saying like a, like anonymous peer review, kind of like pub peer? Oh uh, yeah, so in so in traditional peer review, right? It's blind to both people. Like you you believe reviewer. that an expert is reviewing you and you can you can curse reviewer number 2, but you don't know who reviewer number 2 is. Totally. Yeah. So that that's also like a super interesting question. I, I know pub peer, for instance, um, the grand majority of it is anonymous, um, and, and even the founder of pub peer uh, stayed anonymous for like the first like five years of the project because he's so worried about the professional consequences of allowing people to anonymously like criticize science, which you know is like in theory the best thing possible. <laughs> like your your paper should withstand attacks. You know, it should be a good thing when people attack it. Um, but yeah, so anonymity is very important. Trying to balance like uh, a culture of productivity, like positivity with anonymity, I think can be difficult. I think there's gotta be ways to tie it back to the person's like real life identity on Research Hub. So maybe there's like, a, like when you earn enough reputation, you are given the privilege of anonymous reviews. But if you say something like overly critical and just derogatory or something like that can tie back to your like, uh, you know, real person reputation on Research Hub and then decrease it. So that's challenging because like technically, you know, it's hard to do that kind of thing. So that'll probably be closer to like a V2 or V3 to get that right. But it's definitely something we're thinking about and even just like, like looking at the history of pub peer is it's it's a necessity like it, it'll have to happen if you want people to actually uh give their real opinions because unfortunately in academia there like there's career consequences if you you know like you know, even in good faith criticize you know the wrong person's work so yeah do you guys follow uh dr bick at all on twitter uh at microbiome digest she is by far my favorite twitter account i'll share it here um, so what she does, uh, sorry, I can't do two things at once. Um, she looks at image manipulations. So, um, there's a decent amount of scientific fraud in the world and she just every day will read through papers and look at images and she's really good at pattern recognition. And so she can tell when people have like Photoshopped like figures essentially, like whether it's like a, like a, a microscopy image or something like that or like a gel and she'll call out scientific fraud and um yeah her her twitter can be like uh people come at her <laughs> like there's a lot of vitriol to this person who in theory is doing like this gigantic service to the world for for like not as much as she's you know should be paid for doing it and um yeah when when you criticize somebody else's work or call out somebody else's fraud like there are people who will say very, very mean things back to you. Like she gets death threats and stuff. And so, yeah, I, I think balancing the ability to criticize openly, you know, is really important. And that's like tying like anonymity to some kind of real life consequence where if you say something mean when you're anonymous, it hurts your like ability, you know, to be a real life scientist somehow. 
So the next question came from Chris. Uh, is there something limiting the number of user accounts, IP addresses, or something like that? So you're saying like on Research Hub, could I have like multiple um, user accounts? Yeah, like if I am visiting Research Hub, what's stopping me from creating 25 accounts? Or so if there's anything stopping me? This is like spam is a huge challenge. Uh, that's like been one of the hardest parts of the project so far is like as soon as there are financial incentives, there are people from all over the internet who just want to earn tokens and will come in and do whatever they have to do to earn tokens. And like we always think like in the back of our mind developing any feature, like it's going to be exploited by people who want to, you know, earn tokens. So how do you stop that? Um, it's a challenging thing. Like we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Right now, one of our like best tools is we have like a machine learning filter that helps to essentially like find spam for us. So um, if like one IP address has multiple users, they'll get automatically banned. So that's not like a perfect solution. Like it's good for people who are like not incredibly technical, but it's it's pretty easy just to get like a VPN, you know, and have like whatever IP address you want. So it doesn't work every time, but that's like one solution that we have uh, to prevent people with multiple accounts. I think eventually like we'll have like a like a user ID where like if you want all of your contributions, you know, they'll they'll be tied to one account. There, there's no reason why you can't have a burner though, I guess. Um yeah, so so I guess to answer your question, we have some like uh like some early stage protection against this, but if somebody really wanted to get around it and put in a lot of effort, they could. I think uh like assuming we're able to find product market fit and scale our team that'll be something that we'll have to corral like in the future once we have like the engineering resources to really dig into that problem to make sure that there aren't like duplicate accounts great and umar i think you were next and then yeah i know i and it sounds like uh yeah nick dropped a, a comment and i also have some uh, follow-ups on the uh id and reputation side hello uh big fan of the ron tomatoes approach and research hub in general um I, I've been thinking a bit about like how those reviews get like aggregated, like like so. I guess if you have like ten crowdsourced reviews and let's say like five expert reviews, um, I guess for like the expert group, how do you aggregate that into something someone could look at quickly? Like Rotten Tomatoes does like you know, nine you know like eighty five percent on the new Batman movie. Um, do you see something similar being done for peer reviews, or is it uh, oversimplifying if you? add a quantitative aspect to it? So I don't think so at all. I, I think a quantitative aspect would be amazing just to provide like easy context to when you start to read a paper. Um, I can, I'll find the link here in a second, but um, someone shared a paper on our forum where like the uh, focus was uh, like electromagnetic waves from like um, electronics in your house can raise the blood sugar of people who are diabetic and pre-diabetic which is like a, you know, you see that paper title and you're like, whoa, that's crazy. And like you click into the paper and it was in a peer reviewed, you know, journal. So it's not like, you know, peer review passed it, like it said, okay, we'll publish this. And so the first comment under the paper was somebody who, you know, did the smart thing of Googling the author's name and like the top like 15 results of the author's name are like scientific fraud, you know, like, like this person, you know, like has like a reputation of, having low quality science and so like uh the comment and i'll find it here in a second uh, once i pay attention but um it, it was a whole like a qualitative review that said like here are the reasons why i think that this paper is probably not as good as it sounds like on the surface and then in addition here's this other stuff about the author where they kind of have a history of like uh you know questionable stuff and so when i first saw the title it, like totally transparently i was like whoa like what like that's pretty crazy and i'm lazy like i have a lot to do i didn't read the paper right <laughs> like i saw that it was like a couple case studies and so in my brain i kind of initially discounted it but like i wasn't going to dig into the methods no way i didn't google the author and so um yeah i think it'd be super helpful if when i click on that paper there's some kind of like uh you know like score like one to ten like do people find this you know to be a quality scientific output and then that metric can be broken down into like different categories where we're thinking like 
is the result novel, right? Like, is it likely to be reproduced? Um, like, does this, uh, you know, move the field forward? There's, there's like the categories from that Cochrane uh, review where you could get the reviewers to add a numerical score and then translate that to, you know, like a Rotten Tomatoes type single metric that provides context on the paper. Um, yeah, so, so I think it's pretty valuable. Again, like I'm sure they're like guaranteed there will be negative consequences that come out of this. And so maybe there's something like, um, like you have to answer a question about the paper in order to prove that you've read it first and then you can see the quality score as to not like bias people or something. So like there's, there's a, you know, you can do anything in theory, you know, and so we'll, we'll probably experiment with lots of different things to make sure that like there is that quick, like, hey, is this paper quality or not? How quality? And then ma making sure that that doesn't, uh, you know, kind of like precondition people to perceiving a paper in a certain way. Like we can try and prevent that for sure. That sounds like a really cool approach. I'm, uh... I'm excited to see what that looks like and also maybe hopefully like make that some small part of uh, the peer review experiment we're running, uh, which I think could be cool and fun, uh, but definitely something to still uh, discuss and think about. Um, I have a follow up question, but I or I did and then I forgot it. So if it comes back to me. Um, Anyway, yeah, thank I'm happy you. to jump in with one for now, because I was wondering, we were talking so far about uh, right on the one hand, there's this element of uh, actually, Bianca, I'll let you go first. Please jump in. If you if you want to ask your question, I'll ask mine after. Hi. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, given the open peer review model of your proposal, how do you control for biases uh, among reviewers? Uh, given also all that we know in the literature and, for example, there are recent analyses, especially in terms of uh, the huge bias in citation, for example, that tends to favor white men in research. And also, how do you control for malicious acts, given the economic incentives that are provided in the platform? So if you, for example, request a review to someone that is your basically your academic friend, and this person is paid to review your own paper such that you pass the peer review and you get published, for example. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so the first one, yeah, bias is really important. I always think of like the, the case study of, are, are you all familiar with Alzheimer's research? Like there's this amyloid beta hypothesis that's kind of been the dominant like uh, thought process around like how Alzheimer's, like the pathology of it works. And so, it's interesting because um, this has been the dominant, you know, theory for like 20, 30 years. And the people who are at the top of their fields now who are reviewing grants and like doing these peer reviews on journal editorial boards, like they made their careers based on this amyloid beta hypothesis. And so recently, like people have started to think that maybe there are other ways that Alzheimer's can manifest. And a lot of papers get peer reviewed by people who establish their careers based on a different hypothesis. And so um, these papers will be kind of like suppressed because they sort of invalidate like the experts in the fields, like, you know, prior work history. And so, yeah, there's this huge degree of bias against like different theories, you know, in fields based on kind of like the, the social hierarchy of how those have existed. And it's, it's definitely a problem. Um, I don't have a great answer. Kind of the first thing that I'm thinking is uh, the difference between the audience score and the like expert score. So if you have like three experts, you know, who are all from this like traditional like Alzheimer's like like kind of niche, and they all like negatively review a paper because it invalidates like their prior work history, but a bunch of scientists who maybe don't work in Alzheimer's, but they work in neuroscience and like they like study like immunology in the brain. So they're like kind of familiar with what's going on. They're like, whoa, I don't know. This is like a pretty decent paper to me. And there's a like deviation between the expert score and like the like peer reviewed or crowdsourced score. But to me, that could be a good indication of, hey, maybe we need different experts or like like we can, you know, try and have new people come in to see well, like these expert scores, maybe they actually need to be reviewed themselves to make sure that they are, you know, unbiased. 
But yeah, I think this falls into the category of we're going to need to iterate over time because no matter what we do, we're going to definitely facilitate some biases and we have to just stay aware of it and make sure that like we like try and fix them because uh, they're going to happen and we just need to make sure that we're like quite conscious of it and trying to fix it. And so then the, the second part of your question, I'm sorry, was um, the first was bias. Uh, I can repeat if you want. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was asking, how do you control for malicious acts given, you know, the financial incentives on the platform? At the end, we are all talking about, you know, tokens. So it's kind of like a game theory kind of scenario. Yeah, totally. And, and then the other part was like requesting your friend to review. So yeah, that... yeah, yeah. It's just a consequence of the fact that on one side we have to publish uh, or perish uh, pressure. And on the other side, also the financial incentive can actually uh, motivate people to peer review just for the money. So not and not actually uh, evaluate the, quali the quality of the paper, but make a peer review pass just based on the, the reward. Yeah, 100 percent. And so here's a great example from Reddit that will kind of like help to like lay out our thought process of like moderation on research hub so like if you if you look at online forums and, and i mentioned steam it at the beginning of this the biggest flaw with steam it was um everything was on chain so and, and that's not necessarily a flaw but like anyone could post anything and there was no way to curate that content and so in general the content was really low quality they had like this amazing forum that like was super powerful but like yeah you you couldn't stop people from trying to farm tokens. And so um, we, we strongly believe in like human moderation. Uh, ask historians, there's a couple of research papers about it because um, they do like very, very heavy moderation. And they have like a panel of PhDs in history who essentially like remove anything that's like spammy or low quality. And we feel similarly where like each hub needs a team of humans who are experts in their field in order to help moderate. So the the process for um, finding peer reviewers in theory, because like, you know, me and Sapphic are friends. And so like, if I publish a paper and like, I want some good reviews, um, it's it's not me who requests Sapphic. Like Sapphic can come in and add like a crowdsource peer review score and like try and you know, help me out. But like, I don't have that many friends. So I don't know if I'm gonna be able to like totally outweigh experts. And the experts would be uh, like um, one step away from the author. So the experts would do the peer reviewer recruiting. So it, it would be, I would share my paper and then Eugene as the editor of the hub that I'm sharing the paper in would uh, tap Umar to come in and review the paper. So I don't know Umar, it's Eugene's job to recruit someone, you know, who's like in theory able to review my paper and maybe Umar knows me, maybe we're friends, like there's a chance that could happen, right? But having that one step of like separation where the editor is the one in charge of finding the peer reviewer uh, can help to mitigate like some of like the like citation circle type of behavior you know, where people try and professionally help each other out. Do, do you think that's a, a decent solution for both the bias and potential, like, uh, um, I guess, collusion among reviewers? So, so basically, in your platform, there is no anonymity. At least it's not, uh, it's not going to be, like, implemented. And there is always going to be a third party, which is the editor, like a mediator. Because... Yeah. Uh, the way you explain right now, it's basically the, the traditional peer review process. But still, this doesn't prevent me from my own field to know all the people in my own field and actually, you know, have ways to bypass the, let's say, impartiality of the peer review process. Because it's actually what happens most of the times. I'm not saying that it's like statistically, like uh, most of the cases, for sure, like, reviews manage to be like uh, trustworthy but uh, what usually happens when there are these uh, uh, fraud cases is just that the scientific world the community is so small because at the end in a specific field we all know each other so when the editor is going to choose 
among a selection of peer reviewers is going to point the major figures that are in your specific field. So anyway, there is a higher risk of having someone that is in your circle or collaborating with you, even if it's like one step away. Yeah, it's a great point. And like, that's definitely going to happen at some point. Um, I guess my thought here is, even if it's a super niche field, there are people in adjacent fields who, in theory, aren't aren't within that small circle who can still tell whether a review is in good faith or not. Like to like, you don't have to be an expert in in that small subfield to know whether a review is like adequately criticizing a paper. So to, to me, it seems like there's an opportunity here for the. A crowdsourced review, like the the difference between the experts and the crowdsourced version, where if experts in a subfield are all overly positive, you can have people in adjacent fields essentially come in and disagree. And then like there's a lot of context to a paper that has high expert scores, low crowdsource scores versus high expert scores and high crowdsource scores. And again, like this, I don't think this is a perfect solution. I think it's probably gonna take us like two years to find like a good solution here. So um, yeah, over time we'll we'll see what happens and like document cases where it's not working and try and come up with solutions like kind of on the fly. Yeah, and I wanted to ask also: uh, Is the platform decentralized right now? The research hub. So everything is kind of like a traditional Web two app at the moment, where you can earn like Reddit karma and then withdraw it to Ethereum in order to participate in the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, the reason that we did this is because it's so much easier to iterate. If you have like your entire backend on a blockchain, it's a uh, it's pretty expensive to make changes. And so when branding product market fit, like if you look at like the Y Combinator kind of playbook, um, they say build a V1, put it out there, get feedback, and iterate. And you keep doing that circle over and over again of talking to customers and building something new until all of a sudden you find like the the magic recipe of like features that allows for organic growth and so research hub at the moment we don't have product market fit we don't think we have like just under 100 weekly active users but it's not growing it's basically just the editors plus like a couple of like organic contributors and so um our, our plan is to essentially continue to iterate in like a web 2 uh, app, app style until we think we have like the actual recipe where Research Hub is providing value to the academic community. And then we'll start to build in kind of like Web3 uh, uh, like primitives within Research Hub. So stuff like integrating with our weave, so that way all the content you know, is stored in a decentralized fashion, um, having decentralized identification you know, potentially within the product. Even we've talked a little bit about building our own chain uh, in order to have um, like academic like institutions act as nodes uh, and earn compensation for essentially hosting these like decentralized uh, databases of the content and research hub. But that's a huge project. And like, we're trying to stay as lean as possible until we find product market fit. And then once we do that, we can start to think about how to incorporate like more, I guess like long-term thinking into our apps infrastructure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those questions. Those are great. Thank you for your answers. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll just quickly ask one on the to follow up on some of the the idea and reputation side, and then I'll hand it off to Chris for what might end up being the last question of the hour. But uh, I did want to follow up because we were kind of talking at the extremes of on the one hand anonymity, on the other hand uh, fully open. You know, how much are y'all thinking of trying to iterate around pseudo anonymous? where even if someone would like to shield their individual identity, where they can still gain reputation over time and in turn have a, additional considerations that might not be present if it were fully anonymous. Totally. So actually one of our best editors right now is a, a pseudonymous. Um, I'll try and pull him up. He's like truth on our forum, which is kind of funny. But um, yeah, the, the challenge here is that we can do, uh, I can't pronounce this, but pseudonymity, um, publicly, like it's easy for us to have someone have their own username, like in Reddit, for instance, or Twitter. Um, but it's hard to do it in a way where Research Hub, the company doesn't know who that person is, because we kind of have to like 
confirm they're an expert in order to be an editor. So like we interview them and like look up their like history and make sure that they are who they say they are before they're in the system and then they can be pseudonymous on the app itself. Like that's not an ideal situation because in theory, like, you know, we do have in our database, their real identity tied to their account, you know, and like their email and stuff. And like, it's not the best scenario. I think, uh, yeah, decentralized identification, I think could have like a big role to play here. And so kind of in the same uh, like vein of uh, strategy that I said earlier, we, we don't think it makes sense to build that out pre product market fit, just because um, we don't think that's the feature that's going to really provide the value to academics to, to grow research hub. We think that's like a something that's important once we do have the product market fit, but it's a, it's a tier two priority for us at the moment, but we're also like uh, really, really lucky in that there are a lot of cool groups in DSI working on awesome stuff. And, you know, the whole community loves open source. So um, yeah, like, uh, like Eugene and I mentioned earlier, the uh, OpSci guys are working on like a open source uh, DID, which actually could fit our use case really well. So we may even be able to do this pre-product market fit, just depending on how the DSI ecosystem in general evolves. So yeah, it's it's awesome working in this space because it's like, in a weird way, I feel like we're all kind of in the same company, <laughs> you know, like everybody's sort of working together. Um, yeah, so um, yeah. And Research Hub also is open source. So if anybody wants to take anything from us, you know, feel free to hop into our Slack and our engineers will help make that happen. Thank you. Chris, did you want to jump in next with uh, with your question? Yeah, so I'm thinking about how your process is handling proving uh, the validity of one's claim or uh, refuting the validity of someone else's claim. So if Dr. Bick was on your platform, for example, um, and she raised a problem with someone's uh, numbers, like how does your process recognize her claim versus the other side. And then does the process recognize the reputation of Dr. Bick as being more valid than the data? Or, and that's, that, that's just my question in the sense of like, how does the process recognize, say, someone who is an up and coming researcher versus someone who is an established researcher proposing and then in the context of someone raising a claim that their research is fraudulent, like, how would that, I mean, obviously there's going to be iteration, but like, is that something that your system or your peer review approach is prepared to handle? Yeah, so it's a great point and something we've been thinking about a lot. Um, Within the paradigm of the uh, Figma that I presented, I, I think what would happen here is Dr. Bick would be recruited. And so I guess if she was recruited, she could share, you know, her image manipulation and the expert reviews would be weighted more than the crowdsourced. But as I go through that like thought process, she would probably come in and leave a crowdsourced review as an expert saying like, hey, I read this paper, I found this image manipulation, I want to share about it. And so um, one thing that we plan on building is kind of like a, a Google PageRank algorithm, but for people's scientific expertise, where you can have a weighted upvote. So um, Dr. Bick, in theory, is like a PhD in microbiology. And so like she published a bunch of papers, you know, has a great reputation. Um, she would Page have... Page underscore, bat underscore oh, tech. Okay. Okay. Hack. I, I got worried someone rudely was jumping in and it's like, all right, <laughs> well, I'll fill the air until the, the YouTube uh, video that randomly started playing in the background, the silence. Um, I, have, okay. I have a, um, like a app where it will read basically I, I hate reading. So like I listen to scientific papers. So it's just like a Chrome extension that will take language and like make it audio. But, um, yeah, long story short is we'll, we'll have weighted up voting based on like a user's expertise in a subfield. And then this weighted upvoting, I think the coolest part about it is like, it'll be based on your research hub contributions too. So not just PhDs in microbiology could have high upvote weights in the microbiology hub. You could also uh, spend five years of sharing high quality comments that PhDs in microbiology think are valuable 
And then like an average person could have a similar upvote weight to Dr. Bick after like demonstrating their ability to contribute value to the community. And so this is a future state. We have not built this out yet. It's really easy for me to say that, but I think it's gonna be a lot harder to actually implement. But yeah, we're, we're thinking about how to make sure that experts have more say. Because even if you look at like Reddit, for instance, like Reddit science, like um, I remember during uh, COVID, um, like one of the biggest papers was about how like llama antibodies could be used, you know, as a potential treatment. And it was just because it was about llamas. It was like at the top of Reddit because it was like, oh, llamas, this is awesome. You know, llamas and COVID, great. And it, it was a cool paper. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, it's interesting. But like, I don't think that actual like infectious disease experts are like super excited about llama antibodies. And so um, having a weighted upvote can help to prevent that where like, you know, the average llama fan can have an upvote weight of one, but like maybe a microbiology PhD with three publications can have an upvote weight of 75 or something like that, where you need like 75, like, you know, lay people in order to equal the upvote of one expert or like just throwing numbers out there, but like, having some kind of balance there. It'd be interesting to think of how quadratic funding logic can be used in that direction, but that, yeah, we'll, we'll get there eventually. And I did just want to quickly plug before handing back to Nick, uh, Bianca dropped the link to the answer review paper for anyone who's interested on this topic and has not checked out that paper, please do. It's an awesome one. And I believe it's the only actual uh, paper that's published on web three peer review type things that is an actual paper on it. So, Thank you for dropping that, Bianca. And yeah, Nick, please feel free to jump in with the last question of the session. Sure. Yeah, hopefully a quick one. Um, I'm just curious about, um, I'm thinking that when you reward a peer reviewer, it would probably be helpful, or they should be more rewarded if like their feedback was integrated into the research itself. Like, do you have a mechanism for collecting that as part of the peer review process? Or have you thought about that at all? Yeah, definitely. So like version control is kind of like the, the term we're using here. Um, if you look at F1000, they, they have, the way they do it is incredible where um, I'll, I'll even just go to it. If we have, I've got one minute, but um, yeah, they, they have like, they show the whole process. So they'll show the first review and then they'll show the author's response and then they'll show how the manuscript changed. And then the second version of the manuscript goes to the second reviewer. And then either the second reviewer approves or has feedback for more changes. They show the feedback, they show the author response. They then show the third version of the article that goes to the third reviewer. And um, yeah, it's all in the open. So you can see how the article changes over time based on the peer review feedback. Um, that's like a really important part of this because that's how peer review works in an actual journal. Like you improve the paper in theory. It's not just like a post publication review. So we plan to build that in for basically like the editor, you know, requested professional reviews. Like we'll, we'll basically, you know, try and like steal from what F1 has done uh, or F1000 has done from a UI perspective where I think like they have delicately displayed a lot of information, you know, in, in a way that's like pretty easy to understand. So yeah, I think something similar to that. It's awesome. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick and Sandbrook for joining from, from Research Hub. And this is an awesome discussion, really appreciated it. And yeah, we're working on our own open peer review project, which we'll definitely be talking about more as we make more progress there and are excited to keep learning and sharing as a community. We might also host a Twitter space on the topic at some point in the coming weeks. So I'll make sure to share that as well. But yeah, thank you all for taking the time to, to hang out with us today. Yeah, th thanks for having us. And thanks for all the great questions. Um, when you gonna... you when you guys do the experiment, uh, let us know. We, you know, we can try and help find find some people and stuff to help make it happen. Excited to see what the results are. Oh, I'll definitely keep you in the loop for sure. Yeah, and uh, yeah, again, appreciate uh, appreciate this, and we're we're excited to keep featuring some other projects here as part of our community calls, and just as a way that we can all learn more, provide each other feedback, and and do the best attempts at fixing science that we all can. So, yeah, thank you all again for joining and spending part of your Thursday with us. It's great meeting you. Thank you.